Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui in Beijing. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has joined President Obama to visit Pearl Harbor, the site of the Japanese surprise attack that drew America into the Second World War. Although other Japanese Prime Ministers have visited the site, none has been so high profile as this visit. However, Mr. Abe did not apologize for the attack. He was there instead to console the souls of those who died, according to his spokesman. So what is the reason for this visit at this particular time? How can we understand the concept of contrition and its use in modern diplomacy? And will the Japanese Prime Minister be hoping soon to visit places such as Nanjing in order to console other souls who died at the hands of the Imperial Japanese Army? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy in, to be joined in the studio by Tan Jian Chun, Director of the Department of American Studies at the China Institute of International Studies, and Anna Tangen, author and columnist. In the second half of the program, when we come back, we shall also take the opportunity to talk about the recent UN Security Council resolution condemning Israeli settle, settlements in occupied territory. But before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at this. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has laid wreaths and visited memorials in Hawaii ahead of a visit to the site of the 1941 aerial bombing that plunged the United States into the Second World War. An official apology is not on the agenda during the Prime Minister's visit, however. On that occasion, I'm very much looking forward to sending out a strong message about the value of reconciliation as well as our sincere prayers for those who died in the war. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor and killed over 2,000 Americans. Abe's trip is widely believed to be an attempt to relieve Japan of its past war debts to the U.S. In contrast, the wartime legacy still plagues Japan's relations with China and other Asian countries. China's foreign ministry says Shinzo Abe's visit to Pearl Harbor will not resolve all historical issues from World War II. A visit to Pearl Harbor cannot settle historical accounts. Don't forget that China was the main eastern battlefield in the global anti-fascist war, and the Chinese people made massive national sacrifice to achieve victory. Japan would never turn over this page until it reconciled with China and other Asian countries it invaded. The meeting takes on a special significance, coming just four weeks before the swearing-in, of President-elect Donald Trump, who has sent mixed and sometimes contradictory messages as to the future of American policy in Asia. Japanese media speculate that Abe's visit is designed to send a signal of the strong alliance between the former wartime adversaries remains firm. But after Mr. Trump takes office in January, it remains to be seen if he will indeed deliver on his many campaign promises. Changes will no doubt come to Japan-U.S. relations. Why has Prime Minister Shinzo Abe made a visit to Harbor at this particular time? Uh, this is not a visit of reconciliation and uh, not a visit of condolences by the Japanese Prime Minister. This is a, a political visit by the Japanese leader f and also for the President of the United States. You know, er er early this year, I think in May, President Obama also paid a visit to Hiroshima. And uh, we all know that Pearl Harbor has been a very sensitive place in the history between uh, Japan and the United States. And uh, we heard a story you know, before uh, Shinzo Abe's state visit last year, I mean in April last year, and uh, there was discussion about the possibility for Shinzo Abe to pay a visit to Pearl Harbor on his way to Washington, D.C. But the answer is no, because of the condition at that time was not so mature. So for example, the coming a uh, diet uh, election in Japan. And uh, Shinzo Abe at that time should be very cautious and very careful of any decision touching on, upon the sensitive you know, issues and the uh, size. So this time, uh, I think both, both the leaders from the two countries, you know, they have no such a burden or sensitivity you know, uh, feeding on this uh, arrangement. They just uh, go ahead. For Obama, that might be a legacy of his diplomacy. And for Shinzo Abe, that might be uh, achievements 
uh, for his diplomacy. 75 years on, uh, 71 years on, with the end of the Second World War, Japan has been your closest ally in Northeast Asia, allegedly laying the groundwork for uh, maintaining peace and stability in this region, with the United States assuming regional leadership for the ally. Why do you think Prime Minister Abe still uses words such as value of reconciliation with the United States, giving us the impression that uh, further work needs to be done to advance the job of reconciliation. I mean, that sounds a little bit puzzling for us. Well, it, you shouldn't uh, be confused by it. It's purely optics over substance. What you have here is uh, Abe so uh, looking contrite all right, sounding contrite, but the reality is he isn't. I mean, if you look at his entire speech, he had flowery pra praise for the weather and standing here and talking about these departed souls. But he also decided to talk about a, the forerunner of the kamikaze, uh, one of the, um, a, a wing commander who decided to crash. He would not make it back to his carrier, so he decided to crash into one of the air bases. Now, this was a surprise attack. Uh, glorifying this particular gentleman uh, as a, a hero when he would go on to be the forerunner of kamikazes, which is now the forerunner of these terrorists who believe that they are entitled to go into uh, anywhere and blow up innocent lives. This, this is not the words of a peacemaker. This is not the words of somebody contrite. This is the words of somebody who is trying to make it seem like he's doing this without actually doing it. It's no secret that the Prime Minister Sudabi will not apologize. Mm -hmm. It might be viewed as a reciprocal return to President Obama's uh, refusal to apologize uh, on his visit to Yasukuni, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, Nagasaki. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, mm -hmm. one of the uh, two cities that, were, that was uh, leveled to the ground with the A-bomb toward the end of the Second World War. Uh, let's next let's take a quick look at the open letter that was delivered jointly by Japanese and American historians on the eve of uh, uh, Mr. Abe's visit to Pearl Harbor. Let's take a look. Well, <clears throat> the open letter outlines three basic questions concerning the controversial image of uh, Mr. Abe about the historical issue, such as uh, when he was uh, a very senior uh, director of the uh, Diet Member League, uh, which refused to say anything to apologize in its uh, defining statement, and that caused uh, protests from the victims of Japanese aggression. Uh, so what do you think of uh, the broad background against which this trip of reconciliation took place? Uh, I'm talking about uh, President-elect Donald Trump, mm -hmm. who tweeted that things about the United Nations would change after January the 20th. Everybody understands uh, that would take place after the inauguration. Yeah, I think uh, the president-elect Donald Trump might change some, you know, uh, features uh, in the relation between uh, the United States and Japan. But I think the apology from Japan that would be uh, not a uh, you know, solution for the reconciliation between the countries uh, in this region. And uh, I think uh, Shinzo Abe just manipulated the visit for his own sake and. Uh, uh, actually, if you look at the last year's visit uh, by Shinzo Abe to the United States, he pretended to be a historic visit. He started uh, his visit from Boston. Everyone knows Boston is the birthplace for the United States. And then in Washington, he paid a visit to uh, Lincoln Memorial and also the World War II you know, statue and some other historic uh, sites. And this is actually a double standard you know, at, uh, for Shinzo Abe when he uh, think about the uh, history. This is actually a very 
Yeah. Right. Let I'm, me ask you one follow-up question concerning double standards, uh, quote unquote, from his response. Uh, now, don't you think South Korea and China in Northeast Asia should be the first country, the first mm -hmm. victims uh, that deserve an apology, a sincere one, from Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, instead of uh, uh, adopting double standard, uh, only visiting um, a cemetery of uh, the American war dead in Washington or visiting Pearl Harbor? Well, first off, I, I don't agree that this was an apology in any way, shape, or form. This was just an acknowledgment that people died on his side, on the Japanese side, and on the American side. There's no apology in there. So if he were to come to uh, South Korea or Korea, and any part of Korea, or to China and do the same thing, people would just be enraged. Why would you come and say such empty words, commenting about blue skies and blessed souls? This is absolutely ridiculous. Like I said, he's looking for the optics. He wants his picture standing next to an American president at Hawaii acknowledging the dead, but without actually apologizing. And uh, Mr. Abe, when asked by the media to define aggression, he said the international society has not reached a consensus as to yeah. how to give a clear definition about the aggression. Uh, this this uh, is actually uh, a very you know, uh, ridiculous excuse given by the Japanese politicians, not only Shinzo Abe, for example, uh, some Japanese politicians said uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor actually is a result from the sanctions from the United States and uh, uh, the invasion in the eyes of the politicians it, uh, was some liberation of, of, of the uh, countries like China, Korea, from the Western you know, colonialism. So this is a very you know, ridiculous approach to understand the history in this uh, region. Well, the, these kinds of political rationalizations have been as old. I mean, the reason that they went into Korea and China, as you mentioned, was to, quote, save it from Western powers. Okay. So the irony here <laughs> is that they're apologizing to the only Western power uh, there. They did not go back and apologize to the people that they had things. I mean, people uh, even watching don't understand that the, the war be did not begin with Pearl Harbor. It began in China many years before, mm -hmm. after countless acts of aggression, brutal murder. Uh, Madam Hua Chunying, spokeswoman of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, did give a, uh, an official statement at the mm -hmm. press conference. Mm -hmm. uh, about this uh, uh, visit uh, to Pearl Harbor. But um, uh, many people are trying to figure out why an, a Chinese aircraft carrier fleet has been sent to uh, the West Pacific region for a war game. Mm -hmm. And this uh, uh, fleet actually broke the first island chain mm -hmm. uh, that connects Okinawa with the Philippines. Uh, uh, Taiwan is part of the chain. Now, mm -hmm. what kind of message does this deliver to President-elect Donald Trump and Japan at this uh, uh, sensitive moment? We read a lot of interpretations on this you know, routine training for the uh, task force of our Navy. I think first it's really a routine you know, uh, training for the aircraft carrier battle group to go you know, in the high sea. Mm -hmm. This is a routine arrangement, I think. And the second, of course, uh, to some countries that might be, a, you know, a strong signal to the uh, you know provocative actions. For example, the uh, phone call between uh, Madame Tsai in Taiwan Island and the uh, president elected in in the United States. And uh, uh, it depends on what you interpret from such a training. Okay, I, I think it's a bright red line underlining this idea that uh, Taiwan is not a card to be played at. Uh, basically uh, business negotiations. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is sovereignty. It has nothing to do with trade. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, with, with that, we come to the end of the first part of our discussion about uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe's visit to uh, Pearl Harbor, the site of the outbreak of hostilities at the beginning of the Pacific War. And this trip is taken by the Japanese government as one of uh, reconciliation with the Japanese, oh, sorry, with the United States. We'll be back in a short while. Please stay with us. Welcome back. In the second part of the program, we shall discuss the recent UN Security Council resolution condemning Israel's settlements in the occupied territories. Before we begin, let's look at this. The United Nations Security Council has passed a landmark resolution demanding a halt to all Israeli settlement construction in the occupied territories. 
which Palestine marked a day of victory. This is a day of hope, a day of peace. This is a victory for those who believe in peace, who believe in the two-state solution. The issue is one of the most contentious between Israel and the Palestinians. For decades, Israel has been building Jewish settlements on territory captured in the 1967 war with its Arab neighbors. The settlements are considered illegal under international law, though Israel disputes this. This time, the resolution was passed after the U.S. abstained, breaking with long-standing American practice. Washington traditionally used its veto power to shelter Israel from condemnatory resolutions. Because the United States does not agree with every word in this text, that the United States did not vote in favor of the resolution. But it is because this resolution reflects the facts on the ground and is consistent with U.S. policy across Republican and Democratic administrations throughout the history of the state of Israel that the United States did not veto it. Israel has scored the U.N. Security Council vote and called the U.S. decision to abstain as shameful. The decision taken at the UN yesterday was part of the swan song of the old world bias against Israel. We are entering a new era, and as the US president-elect Donald Trump said yesterday, this is going to happen much quicker than people think. Netanyahu had tried to prevent the vote by appealing to US president-elect Donald Trump, who tweeted calling for a US veto on resolution and persuading Egypt, who drafted a resolution, to postpone the vote. Welcome back. Now, the Israeli government delivered a stir warning to four of the uh, P5 of the UN Security Council that uh, working relationship would be suspended, suspended. due to their anger about, the, uh, about passing the UN Security Council resolution condemning Israel for the uh, settlement of Jewish, Jewish settlements in the West Bank. So what do you think of uh, uh, the immediate response from China? What, what's your hunch uh, about China's response? Because uh, We've been always uh, taking side yeah. with the Arabs on uh, are all um, crucial uh, issues in the Middle East, uh, showing sympathy with the Arabs. But this time mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. uh, Israel has been so tough to China. I, I don't think China has changed the position in this regard because you know, it's our long-standing uh, policy to support the Palestine to have a uh, you know, country or to some uh, establishment in the area in occupied territory by the Israel. So I think... Uh, what is your estimate that um, the Israeli authorities uh, would uh, impose uh, some kind of punitive measures, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. in areas of uh, high-tech cooperation and agriculture assistance. Uh, no, I, I don't think in that way. I, I think this is only a diplomatic signal given by the Israeli uh, government. Just and uh, what do you think uh, would be the most likely uh, response from, uh, a further response from the Israeli side? Uh, I mean, will they suspend uh, the alleged arms sales, although it could be second-tier arms sales to China? Will they uh, temporarily suspend technological transfer or would they uh, prevent any investment from the Israeli side. Uh, I mean, what would be the uh, uh, negative uh, impact? Okay, uh, let's put this in perspective. This is a nation of 7.8 million people. It wouldn't even be a second tier city in China, right? The, their economics are not good. They're heavily dependent because so much of their um, energy and things like this are imported. They're constantly running a deficit. Their economy is in not in good, in not good shape. They are not in a position to dictate to the rest of the world what should be happening, all right? And quite frankly, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling that somebody like Netanyahu, who is the representative of Israel, but not the Israeli people as a whole, threatening economic ties at a time mm -hmm. when Israel needs to make friends, not more enemies. Uh, it is disturbing to talk about this new world order. If he's depending on Trump, I think he's going to be solely, uh, sorely disappointed. Trump is a player. He will play the Israeli card in any way or fashion that he deems that he will get a, a political or economic win. So this is not a sustainable. What do you think of the court had a roadmap encouraging uh, the idea of a, a two state, um, meaning the independence of the Palestinian uh, state? Uh, that has remained a controversial issue for the Israeli authorities, uh, but it's a, an appeal, a consistent one from Arabs and Palestinians in particular? Uh, first, I should say there are at least uh, two obstacles for the establishment of a country, uh, you mean Palestine, 
I think the first is from Israel. I don't think uh, the current Israeli government will give any you know, opportunity to the Palestinian to have an individual independent country in the Middle East. And the second obstacle, uh, even this time, you know, the United States uh, uh, not veto the uh, resolution. But I think the coming uh, government administration you know, under, under the leadership of uh, uh, Donald Trump will continue the traditional policy to support uh, Israel in this region. So there are at least uh, two obstacles uh, uh, on the way to have an uh, independent state in the Middle East, I mean, the Palestine. There are three basic devastating issues concerning the, what is called the uh, Middle East peace process. One is, of course, the issue of refugees in their millions who are scattered throughout the neighboring countries, uh, Arab countries of Israel. The second is, of course, uh, uh, position of Jerusalem, and the third is whether um, uh, territory uh, before the 1967 war should be returned to uh, Palestinians. Uh, I wonder if I can characterize the nature of the issue precisely, but uh, what do you think of the prospects of the Middle East peace process with these three major issues uh, as the obstacles in the way? At this point, zero. I mean, zero. Uh, yes. And you mean the peace process is actually moribund? It's, it's moribund. It's, it's dead uh, on arrival. I don't know how else you can put it. I mean, it's not just Israel. I mean, Israel is lo losing the, pup, um, the pup soft power mm -hmm. debate every day that goes on. Uh, the Palestinians have re, uh, figured out that rather than throwing bombs, all they need to do is play a card that they are being forced into apartheid and they're winning. But on the other hand, the Palestinians have never been willing to recognize the Jewish state uh, and they have said repeatedly that the entire uh, state of Israel belongs to them. So you're at these loggerheads where nothing will happen. This adds uh, maybe some moral fire to an already blazing inferno. It's not going to work, and I don't know how Donald Trump thinks he's going to solve it. It doesn't come as a surprise that Arabs in their millions in the neighboring countries of Israel want to wipe out this Israeli state. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, President Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, threatened to uh, do exactly the same, and uh, he even went as far as to deny such a thing as a Holocaust in the Second World War. That certainly mm -hmm. angered the Israeli government. But what do you think of uh, the uh, loggerheads? Uh, between President Obama and the Prime Minister Netanyahu, who, who visited the D.C. Uh, giving a speech to the joint session of the U.S. Congress without being received by President Obama. I mean, obviously there was a very frosty relationship between the two persons. Well, Netanyahu violated things. I mean, if you go to somebody's country and you <laughs> stick your finger in their, in their eye, don't expect them to be thankful to you. Uh, obviously, there is some personal feelings that are going on in this particular uh, international debate. I don't think Obama likes him. He certainly doesn't. So it's not going to, to work out long term. Donald Trump, as I said, is an unknown for everybody. Uh, part of the legacy game for President Obama, the outgoing one, is uh, the lifting of economic sanctions against Iran due to the uranium enrichment program. Uh, that's a result of the six plus one a negotiation, a marathon one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but Israel was firmly against the idea of lifting the economic sanctions. And many Republicans also did the same, expressing the anger at lifting the economic sanctions. So uh, is there any hope and chance uh, for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to have a serious rapprochement with the next president, Donald Trump? I no, I don't think so. Because you don't uh, think so? the deal made uh, uh, between uh, Iran and uh, the other six countries actually, you know, uh, at at uh, different levels. First, from the uh, non-proliferation, this is really a very successful deal made by the international community, and if. Uh, we look at the geopolitical, you know, approach. This should be a, a failure for the United States to have a good relation with Israel, with Saudi Arabia. So, the Iranian issue actually is another obstacle for the uh, U.S. You know, to have a very balanced relation, a very good relation with Israel.
And do you foresee that um, economic sanctions will be reimposed by the Donald Trump administration well, uh, he, upon he, Iran? Yeah, but the, the, the issue here is he would be doing it unilaterally. He, he would not be, have the support of the other nations mm -hmm. around there. So if he wants to end the U.S., uh, take action from the U.S. side, he can bear the consequences of it. But as we're discussing this, one of the things that occurs to me is that we're discussing two issues which seem unrelated. Uh, the Shinzo Abe appearing in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and then um, Israel, and Netanyahu in this resolution. But in, it's, it's interesting how these two things come into focus when you think these are the two greatest allies of the United States since the Second World War. And now we're in a situation where one consistently refuses to acknowledge its responsibility in one sense, and the other one is refusing to act responsibly under international law. This is really putting the U.S. in a completely different light, and one that is not too favorable. Junichiro Koizumi was the former Japanese prime minister who said uh, an arc of uh, freedom and prosperity should be constructed, mm -hmm. uh, connecting American allies and partners in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, if your closest ally, and you said the greatest ally since the end of the Second World War, refused to share the value of uh, complying with international law mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. even to apologize to victims of this mm -hmm. aggression, that will put into question the American uh, role well, uh, perhaps uh, we'll come back to examine the impact of such a kind of a relationship. With that, we come to the end of this discussion. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.